everyone. Welcome to how to hold a virtual or hybrid memorial service. I'm Mandy and here we have Christina. And yeah, my name is Christina and give me just a moment. I am going to ask Jess if she can uh, stop her screen share just for a moment and then we will get started. If you haven't already, um, put where you're from in the chat. The chat box will be open. And while I'm on the subject of the chat, if you have any questions while we're speaking today, feel free to write them uh, in the chat directly. So Mandy and I will not only be talking about um, hosting a virtual or a hybrid memorial service, as you see right here, but we will also be answering your questions as they come up. So I'm going to take a sec. So many Canadians, by the way, I'm very excited yeah, about this. <laughs> I see some f familiar names and faces and this, well, I, I see one familiar face, which is Mandy. Uh, <laughs> oh my goodness. And with that, we're off to a great start. So um, welcome everybody. Um, as Mandy had said, Mandy, um, we'll, what we'll do is we'll go through a little bit of an introduction. Um, Mandy is gonna be talking about uh, virtual memorials. I will come in with hybrid. We will kind of wrap it all together. And then we'll, if we have questions, we'll do some Q and A at the end. Um, so with that, we'll start, uh, Mandy you can take it away. Yeah, hey everyone. So we wanted to start just by telling you a little bit about our stories so that you kind of understand why we are talking to you about this today and why we kind of know what we're talking about. And that way um, we can give you advice really based on our, our experiences. Um, so as mentioned, I'm from a company called Keeper. And um, when we created Keeper in 2013, our focus was really to enable communities to come together and create what we call the quilt effect, where everyone's able to share their piece of that person, whether it be a picture they have or a story they have of that individual, and it all comes together on an online memorial page. And we found this process to be really healing for families who are going through a loss and really our goal is to create you know, a safe space to meaningfully memorialize someone and um, really giving families that tool set that they need to do that. And um, our goal is also just to spark curiosity. Um, really when we started Keeper, it was, the, the idea was what if we could learn about the story behind every single person in a cemetery? And um, my personal story related to this talk in particular, um, unfortunately, right at the beginning of the pandemic, um, my grandmother, she was admitted to the hospital just for a fall. And because it was right at the beginning of COVID, so this was April 2020, um, as a standard, they tested her for COVID. And it turned out she was positive. And um, it only lasted five days. Uh, she was in the hospital and instantly her uh, respiratory system broke down. She couldn't breathe without oxygen and she passed away five days later on April 25th. And um, as mentioned prior, I've been working in the end of life space since 2013 and as someone who's really dedicated their career to reimagining the way that we die and the way that we memorialize someone, I knew that I had to do something. And so my cousins and I came together and we put together a completely virtual memorial service for her in her honor. And um, I live far away. All my cousins are actually kind of desperate. Um, the family was all in different parts of Canada and the US and in Europe. And I thought it was really interesting because even though my family is very contemporary. We always held very traditional funeral services, which I always found to be incredibly impersonal. Um, after the service that we did for my grandmother completely virtually, we received so many messages. People were so touched and so moved by it. And of course, surprised. Um, and I feel like I can confidently say that it was one of the most meaningful memorial services we had held within our family. And so after this event, I knew I needed to help other families navigate memorializing someone during the pandemic. And as we're gonna see even afterwards today, our new normal. 
And so I'm going to share some of my personal experiences with hosting this service for my grandmother. Um, but then on the next slide, you'll see that in our solution, this is actually what we started doing. So as mentioned before, we build online memorial pages. You can be, let's say you're a death doula or you work at a hospice or you're a funeral home or a cemetery. We have like a full business service, but we also are just direct to family. So you can go on our website, make a memorial page for someone. And then on top of that, our event pages allow you to actually coordinate that event. And we'll talk to you about that further. And we started offering virtual hybrid and live streaming memorial service facilitation. So we actually have families that call us, just like what Christina is going to talk to you about what she does. And we put everything together. We coordinate it, we facilitate it, we make the media for it. And so we're going to talk to you about, in terms of my experience, both personally and professionally, on how we did that. Excellent. Thanks, Mandy. And just a brief little introduction of myself and New Narrative. I started New Narrative as a solution in an event planning market where there was nobody specialized in, in special events that were dedicated to memorializing someone and celebrating a life. So I have a decade of event experience. And in 2017, um, after my uncle died, uh, for those of you who don't know already, I am Italian and my mom, the, the age old story is that my mom voluntold me because I had this event experience. And after, uh, very similar to Mandy, I, I figured out pretty quickly that um, it would be a disservice for me not to use my event experience to help other families that needed to do, needed to put together their arrangements for a 500 person event in two weeks. And so new narrative was, uh, was conceived and we've been around since 2017. And at the very beginning of the pandemic, we switched to virtual events. Mm -hmm. And so you can see a little bit of our story. Um, all of the photos that Mandy and I will be sharing, like she had mentioned, um, are real and they've all been We've all had permission from these families that we've worked with. Um, as you can see here on the screen, on the left-hand side, uh, you can see the backdrop. This is Wine Soap Cougar in the background. This was the very first celebration of life that I did in 2017. So uh, we honored a friend of a friend's mom who passed of cancer and she loved everything about the 80s. And so everybody was with the 80s and Wine Soap Cougar was her nickname in her little circle. Um, in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see a photo of my Uncle Brett. And in the bottom right hand corner is just a picture of me on an event site. So um, like Mandy, I also had an experience during the pandemic with, um, with coordinating a virtual service. So my grandfather passed last year in June and my dad and I went over to Toronto and actually had that two way hybrid experience to bring our family and, and close family friends from Vancouver into that uh, service. So a little bit back to new narrative, um, our solution is that we're an event company, we've got specific expertise in, do, in planning celebrations of life, and ultimately we take care of the details so that families can take care of themselves. Um, and on the screen here on the left hand side you'll see a photo of the very last event that I planned right before the pandemic I think it was one week before the restrictions set in here in Vancouver and uh, what you see on stage is a barber a full barbershop group and uh, there are honoree in the background in his barbershop uh, outfit so that's so cute our goals yeah it was it was really sweet and you know wrangling about 30 30 gentlemen to or 20 to 30 gentlemen and you know assigning the seats for them and saying okay let's practice getting up out of our seats and going on stage and come back and so that everybody knows what to do and so yeah what we do what we do virtually is is a virtual version of that so preparing everybody making sure that they know what to do great and that brings us to today yeah so today what we're really going to focus on is or who it's really for is twofold and i'm actually going to ask you guys after to tell us who you are, where you fit. So today's webinar, seminar, talk, whatever you want to call it, we're going to talk to you about how you can actually host a memorial service, either virtual, hybrid, for perhaps a loved one, a family, a friend, something that you just want to do on your own. Maybe you um, experienced a death during the pandemic and you haven't had the chance to memorialize that person yet. 
It's never too late. Memorial services are incredibly meaningful no matter when they are. Furthermore, this is also for those of you working in event planning, in the end of life space, maybe you're a doula um, who really want to be conducting these services for families you serve. So when you have a second, go in the chat, let us know, what do you do? Are you a death doula? Like, are, are you hoping to coordinate these services for your own clients? Are you doing this for a family? Let us know so we can also kind of tailor what we say to you guys. Totally. And so I'm going to start off, as Christina mentioned, I'm going to talk about virtual. Christina is going to talk about hybrid. You're going to see there's going to be a lot of similarities. And so we're going to kind of go back and forth. Um, we'll try to make the differences very clear. Some of them are quite obvious. And um, we're really going to talk to you about what you need to help you with both of these types of events and um, the different kinds of roles they can play. Uh, the equipment you need for a successful event, some tips, how to practice and plan ahead. And so within the key takeaways, as you can see, we're really going to focus also on how you can make them interactive. That's super important. And um, some of these activities you can do for that interactivity, um, really important on the tech team and on the different roles and some of the online tools we recommend. So yeah, it seems like a lot of you are going to try to work with families. So some of you are going to be working for your own family. Okay. So I think we can kind of tailor that, right? Oh, totally. This is great. It's also really fascinating, it's fascinating to see how many uh, professions there are and that are being created and that are being pursued in this community. It takes truly takes a village. Perfect. And Definitely. So by the end of this, um, we are confident that you will be able to have the knowledge to bring this back and to at least at least be able to speak confidently about it. Um, I know that was a big goal um, when we first started talking about our seminar. So let's get down right to the basics. So you may be wondering what a hybrid event is, what an input, you know, what constitutes a live stream or what options that you have. And right now with this virtual option that we have, we've nailed or we've whittled them down into four, four um, options for memorial services. The first one being a live stream where you can see the camera is set up in the event space. It's a one way view and guests can write messages and you can review those messages, but nobody can speak. Um, in an in-person event, it's kind of the, the opposite. So you have people gathering in person and you can speak, but you don't, you don't see any recorded messages and it's only you, your group that's in the room for an in-person event. For a completely virtual service, what happens is everybody logs in virtually. So everybody uses a computer, a smartphone, tablet, or even the phone to log in and to participate that way. And a hybrid, and Mandy will be speaking about that, and a hybrid event is where you combine the in-person and the virtual. So you get the venue, you invite people to your space, and then you set up a TV or a monitor and you have someone connected to the Zoom stream and can interact with your virtual guests or just have them up just viewing the event. Um, I think both Mandy and I definitely prefer Zoom video. We use Zoom all the time. Um, we just find that it's very, very easy to use, um, very, very user-friendly. And of course, um, due to the events of the last year, if you don't, you know, if your family member doesn't know how to use Zoom, chances are you have a younger person or, you know, someone else in your circle that understands. I um, just wanted to explain a few of the benefits of including a virtual or a hybrid component. So I, being an event planner and working on a few in-person events, I have families now that are just saying, we don't want a virtual component. We want to be together and we just want it to be in person, which absolutely, I, I am not saying not to do that. Um, but here are some considerations that, that you could you could think about. Um, so the biggest one being with virtual, you can actually expand the guest list and you can have up to hundreds of people who would otherwise be unable to attend. So under otherwise be unable to travel or to make it um, because of 
pre-existing commitments or because of uh, family circumstances or other situations. Um, and you can include people from all over the world. So for example, I'm working with a family where we have a doctor who was known worldwide. And so we have people coming in from all over and we have people like Australia, the Philippines, the United Kingdom, um, all across Canada, the US, et cetera. Um, and one thing, one of the big points that I wanted to pay um, I wanted to talk about a little bit more is this last point. So giving those in the quote unquote outer circle a chance to show their support. So in my experience planning these events, I sometimes find that guests will shy away from RSVPing to an in-person event um, because they don't feel either comfortable going or they don't feel like they're a part of the family. So for instance, when my grandfather passed away, um, the neighbor from down the street who was instrumental in the last couple of years of his life felt that the funeral was just a family only event, but because we had the virtual component, she was able to come and attend and think of these people as neighbors, um, teachers, colleagues, teammates. And if you wanted to pay respects, a virtual component would be a way that you can participate and you can open it up so that more people can show their support and be there with your family. So now that I've, and now that I've said why, how, how good it can be or what the benefits are, Let's go, we'll go back to the beginning and the basics and we'll go into planning a virtual event. Yeah, and just on that note, Christina, I think something that we're all probably questioning and this, I get this question a lot too and we don't have as much time so we won't go into detail, but people are gonna be more used to now having a virtual element and people are gonna be hesitant mm. to travel as much. So just when I talk to like business associates and stuff and we talk about conferences and things we're gonna to go to, folks are gonna be looking for more virtual events. And so if you have like a family member who's like a little elderly and maybe sick and traveling on a plane can be really, really difficult for some older folks. And this really, as Christina mentioned, like allows you to really open it up. But I think I personally, and I believe Christina feels the same way that these types of virtual components to events, they're not gonna go away with, with COVID. We've kind of created a new expectation. Yeah, that's funny. I, I'm planning an event at the beginning of September and somebody emailed me and said, is there gonna be a virtual component? I was like, no, virtually <laughs> not. But anyway, I digress. Yeah. So basics of a virtual funeral. You're gonna notice that a lot of these are gonna be similar for your hybrid, but you have a few other elements you need to consider. The first thing, it might seem super basic, but if any of you have planned a wedding, you know, pick a date. And for a virtual, for a service, picking a good time is really important as well. My best advice for you here is do not worry about accommodating everyone's schedules. You have to work with the immediate family. So in my situation, when we were coordinating my grandmother's service, um, everyone's very busy, but we coordinated directly with the immediate family members that work in hospitals so that because they're first responders, we kind of gave them the biggest priority to say that we'll, we'll make whatever you can do work because they had to be there. Um, and really, hopefully still, people are in isolation, people are home, they will make the time and the people that need to be there will be there, right? So I don't want you to stress about that ever just find something that's convenient. And then on the actual time itself, um, think about your guest list and think about where they are geographically located. So what we did is we hosted it at 5.30 p.m. Eastern because we knew most of our attendees would be off work. It was a very big working group, but then we also had a lot of West Coasters. So that was still a very decent time for West Coasters. If you have European family, a good time could be noon Eastern. Noon Eastern is great for East Coasters. Obviously, they're on lunch if it's during a work day. 9 a.m. is not too bad for a Pacific. And then it'll be the evening in Europe. So just look at your time zones. I use a tool called Time Savvy. It's just a website. It's a really great tool. Yeah, it's awesome. You just put in the locations and it's like, it's this location here and here and here. And so I find that really helpful. So this is the most important, as you'll see, because the date and time are key for you to be able to send the invites and get everything set up. Once you know the date, it'll like remove a stress from you for sure. And then the next step would be to create the video conferencing tool or choose it. 
Um, as Christina mentioned, I also very much recommend Zoom. It's really one of the only tools where you can see that many people. You can mute and unmute people at the same time. You can do a screen share while having someone also on the top, like also visible, spotlighted. So that way, let's say you're doing a eulogy and you're showing pictures and someone's reading it. You can see them, you can see the graphics. Um, and also quite simply, as Christina mentioned, like everyone knows how to use it. Like grandparents know how to use it now. We're just so used to it with the pandemic. So I definitely recommend that. And also quick tip, if you're just doing one event, go for the premium, spend 20 bucks and then cancel your account because it's not worth it. So for those of you that aren't aware, if you have a non-premium version of Zoom, it will end your meeting after 40 minutes, right? Or better so yet, hire a company. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, I of course. That. I would be that remiss too. if I didn't say that. <laughs> so it's worth the money um, and it definitely is the best way to go. It'll be the least stressful for you. And number three is design and send invitations. Again, I'm always going to mirror this to weddings because I feel like a lot of people are more used to planning weddings, maybe not in this room actually, but um, save the date. It's always very important. You want people to be able to put it in their calendars right away. They can make sure they don't get meetings booked around it. And we will talk about the design part um, a bit later. So we'll put a pin in that one, but sending the invites as soon as you have your date and time, very much recommend that. And then the next thing we're gonna talk about in more detail is designating roles. Designating the roles early makes sure that everyone has enough time to really coordinate and plan and write or build whatever they are going to be doing during the talk. And just a reminder, we are talking fast because we have so much to talk to you guys about, but please, we have the Q&A open. If you have any questions, even that come up while we're talking, feel free to shoot us a message in there, okay? All right, so roles in a virtual event. The first role is sort of a given. It's going to be the family members, the planning team. Um, and so these are the people that are essentially responsible for the elements of the program. How do you come up with the elements of the program? Get to know the person you're honoring. Talk to the family about that individual. Like what did they love? What did they do? What was their pastime? And then they are the key people who are gonna give you those photos, those videos, the elements that you need for your service. Without getting to know the honoree, you won't have a service and it won't be meaningful. It has to really be personalized and catered to that person. So they're the ones that, you know, as the planner, as the facilitator, or as the family yourself, you should think about what you want. You should think about what would be meaningful for you and for, and to honor that person. So is it really just about photos and doing slideshows? Is it about home videos? Um, all of that information. And of course, that's the biggest challenge to be honest that I've had is having families rummage through their boxes of photos, scanning them and getting them to you. So you wanna work with the family and the planning team as early as possible because if you're working with families, you may have to chase them to get everything you need to put it together. Um, and then of course the guest list, probably what you need to do before you start creating the um, videos because you need to send out your invites. So a lot of the information you need is in the brains of your planning team and your family. And we need to extract that from them for lack of a better word. Um, and then the other very important role in a virtual event is the speakers. So determining who's going to speak and who's going to say what. And so they could be reading a eulogy, they could be just sharing a story, telling a remark. And there's some different ways that this can happen. So they can speak live during an event. They can either have something pre-prepared or not. I do recommend having something prepared. If not, people can go really, really long. So make sure that they're aware of that. I used to say, give someone two minutes and they'll take five. Give yes. someone five minutes, they'll take 10 and then don't give someone a time and you never know when, when they're gonna stop. <laughs> uh, so yeah, um, a two to three minutes is usually a good, like that's my go-to. Cause it's like, you know, some people go over, some people go under. They find two to three minutes. It's yeah, nice. that's great it's like advice. the chef's kiss. <laughs> awesome. 
And then other ways you can do it is also you can have the me the, the message or, or the speaking portion um, pre-recorded. So we've done this in certain situations where we've had eulogies and um, let's say that a child of the person who we're honoring, um, they were the ones that wanted to read it, but they either were had a little stage fright, were a little nervous to do it, or they just knew they wouldn't be able to get through it. So it removes a big stress from the, from the speaker if you pre-record it. My personal opinion is that if you have a lot of pre-recorded stuff, it kind of just feels like people are watching a video. I don't like, I always like to have live speakers during events. It's way more engaging that way, but that is always a possibility. And so it could be, um, what often happens actually for us is that um, if someone can't make it, uh, and they definitely wanted to speak, they'll share a video of themselves talking um, of like their speech and we'll play that video. Or some things that we often do is we'll do a eulogy where it'll be like a slideshow of pictures of the person and we'll have just the voiceover of the person reading it out. So someone can just like take their phone and record the audio and that's it. So lots mm -hmm. of ways that speakers can be involved. Um, and then virtual tech team. So your tech team is super, super important. And depending on the size and how comfortable you are, there's two different ways you, or there's diff multiple different ways you can do this. But typically you'll have a facilitator or your host who can also be the master of ceremonies and then a tech person. Oftentimes, if it's like a smaller event, you could be the tech person and the host, but really depends on the individual and depends on how comfortable they are and how big the group is. If you have a really large group, you will most likely want to have a separate tech person. That way the host just has to worry about um, what's happening on screen, making, you know, rallying the troops kind of thing, making sure that everyone's happy, everyone's good, keeping the flow nice. Because if you have a big order of service and you're trying to keep the flow and do the technical, it's not going to be as smooth. So the, the host or the master of services will, or they'll be able to prepare the order of service. Um, they would also, of course, host the rehearsal. You would want your tech person and your host or your master of ceremonies at the rehearsal all the time. And um, of course, the host is just the one that kind of welcomes everyone and facilitates it all. So they welcome everyone at the beginning and they will um, introduce speakers before they talk, giving them their cue and the tech person will share their screen, play videos, et cetera. And, uh, and yeah. before we move on, so we do have a question in the question box oh. pertaining to sharing a screen sharing and video sh or music sharing specifically. So in a virtual service, um, can, we, can you talk about the best way to play music as smoothly as possible? So yeah, uh, go I ahead can, with, with your, with your suggestion, Christina. Oh yeah, absolutely. So if you go, unfortunately for all of you attending, you cannot do this, but on your little zoom screen, I might be able to take a screenshot and show you, but at the bottom, there should be that little green button that says share screen. And actually, if you want to share a video with sound, there's going to be two little uh, buttons that you can check off at the bottom and that will uh, share original or share sound from share computer sound is what I'm trying to say. And that will share what's called the native computer sound. So it will sound to all of your attendees like it's coming from their own computer, even so it won't be distorted or it won't be muffled or anything. Um, if you want to share music only, there's also one of my favorite features that I'm using right now is uh, when you do the screen share, at the top, there's a little button called, or there's a tab called basic, one that says advanced, and then one that says files. Um, side note, you never have to use files. Um, but if you go into advanced, you can actually do share sound only. And that means that nothing, guests that are in your Zoom meeting will not see anything on your screen, but they will hear what is coming from your computer. So also that includes notifications. So make sure that you disable all notifications if you're going to share computer sound, because then everybody's everybody's computers will, you know, pop off. But in this way, you can share songs from YouTube, songs from Spotify, Apple Music, or your preferred method of playing a video or a um, 
sorry, a video or a music file. Yeah. And, and then... on that note, um, just for the audio piece. So if you're doing like multiple songs, so sometimes what we'll do is we'll play multiple songs at the beginning to let people come in. And so if your question is about as smoothly as possible, create a playlist. So either yeah. create a playlist on Spotify or I just do it on my desktop. I use VLC. I'll like click on the images. I hit do playlist. You make sure that the songs play one after the other. Practice it before so you can make sure it's smooth. And yeah. that's it. It's quite simple. Okay, Mandy, there is a very juicy question here in the Q&A. May I ask this before we move on to hybrid? <laughs> of course, let's do it. I love it. I, th I think it's great. So, okay, Andrea says, an insight I've learned from meeting facilitator and author Priya Parker, who's fantastic, never start a gathering with logistics and housekeeping. And she wholeheartedly agrees and wants to know what we think and if there is a superb way to open a hybrid celebration of life. So I'd love to hear, yeah, I'd love to hear what, what you, I, I definitely have some thoughts on this, but you, you I go ahead, go that. ahead. Do your thing. <laughs> I think if you're having a virtual component there and, and you were having any virtual attendees, I feel like there is nothing that there is always room. What am I trying to say? That housekeeping of how to use zoom and how this event will go i think will bring a lot of peace of mind to some of your attendees um because not only is this a brand new format but it's also um you know they've never used chances are they haven't used zoom in this way or they haven't attended an event that that you've run and i find these housekeeping notes incredibly incredibly helpful just to say, hello, my name is Christina Andriola and we're here today. Um, I just have a few notes. One, just so you know, the event is being recorded. If you need help, here's where you go. Here's who you call. Here are the two settings. You can go speaker view, which means one at a time or gallery, many people on screen and just giving everybody that, that sense of here's what, you know, here's what is going on and here's how to control your screen would give them peace of mind. That's my, my personal opinion is like, I love it for a hybrid event. It's different. Um, I would say if you can coordinate with your celebrant or whoever your master of ceremonies is in person, they can include that in their opening notes, just mentioning that we are joining, we have guests joining us virtually and that if they would like to change, um, settings, here's how to do so. Or sometimes we forego the introduction for a hybrid event and we just post in the chat so that anybody joining virtually has that uh, has that information in the chat. Yeah, and a few other ideas to add to that. Um, on the hybrid side, something you can also do, which we've done is, um, I actually like to get my virtual guests on a hybrid event online first. And, I, and you can even do your intro of the tech side just with your virtual guests. Be like, hey, we're gonna right. join everyone soon. Here's some more info just for you virtual folks. That mm -hmm. way the people in person don't have to worry about the tech stuff because it's not really their problem, right? Um, and then something else we've done is in the actual invitations, we will share videos or screenshots of Zoom uh, etiquette and Zoom information. Mm. So we really ask the family, how like what is like the level of technology within this family? Is, a, is it a lot of old folks who are not familiar? Is it more of a younger crowd? And then we decide what we're gonna do. We'll sometimes forego the technical stuff completely and we'll just send it in an email before. And that way people are, they kind of get their, they're comfortable there. And if they have issues, they'll email us before. And we've even done like run throughs with family members who are really anxious about using Zoom. Yeah. yeah. And like, yeah. they're like so grateful. And then like, they just know exactly what to do after. Totally. And I got to say, if any of you who are attending have suggestions or things that you've seen that you've really appreciated or really enjoyed, definitely put them in the chat. Of course, this is only, we've only been doing this for, you know, the for a better, Mandy and I have been doing this for about a year. And of course, there are other companies who've been doing this longer, but if you've experienced anything that you've really liked, definitely put it in the chat. We're all here to learn and share. Even us, even the, yeah. the experts are always, we're always learning and we always want to make things better. Um, so speaking of the hybrid events and how you can incorporate hybrid, 
um, I will be talking a little bit about hybrid and kind of what to expect, what it looks like, and just some views that uh, you will see at a hybrid event. So a hybrid event is where a part of the service, the ceremony, or the event takes place at a physical location and guests are participating via a virtual stream. So this can be in a funeral home, a place of worship. Um, I think you can see my mouse right here. So the TV screen at a private backyard, it can be here in a tented venue, up here in a funeral home or a hall, and then this it's out of frame in here. But um, you can really have the in-person event kind of anywhere and have a screen set up so you can see, see and interact with your people. Um, the one on the bottom right, the along the water, was actually for a wedding ceremony. And uh, I did this recently as well. We had the laptop of people. And during the ceremony, we actually brought the laptop over to the couple, um, or you can bring it to the family so that they can see everybody in person. Um, and what that looks like to the Zoom viewer is up here on the top right. And what, sorry, the Zoom viewer is at the bottom right and the in-person view is on the top right. And so I know you can, the views here are a little different, like on the TV, they don't quite match up, but I can assure you they were taken, I think maybe about a minute apart, but there were about 10 people inside the event venue and they were looking at a TV. The celebrant was at the podium in the center. And then on the right-hand side, you can see the family is around a table, which was set up as an altar, um, had a couple candles on it, our honorees baking. And um, at the bottom for the virtual view, guests who logged in virtually could see a little video. This is if they're in gallery view. They see a little video box of um, the actual venue. And then um, this is my lead tech, Rob, myself, who's the facilitator. And then on the right-hand side, we actually had a couple of extra devices in the room. So we had a, an iPod and a phone on different little stands so they could capture the t-shirts. You can see the t-shirts under the TV here, and we had a camera station to capture them. So it just goes to show it's um, this, this is what it could look like if you're in a particular um, event space. If you're in a church, this is a view from this past weekend. Um, my colleague Andrew is here at the bottom and you can see that there is the Zoom screen that is on the projector. And so guests, when we had someone spotlit or just highlighted front and center, um, they were able to see both people side by side. And this also works when we share a video or music or a slideshow. This, the slideshow or the piece of media will be the biggest part of the screen. And then uh, as you can see on Zoom, this was the virtual view and um, we are currently co-spot, uh, two spotlights, but you can just have one. And so this is pretty much what it will look like. I think this is, this picture on top is an enlarged version of something like the one on the bottom. So yeah, yeah just, and something just to quickly point out that I think is mm -hmm. really fascinating that a lot of people don't realize you can do with hybrid is you can have a couple of devices. Like you said, you can have a oh, phone, yeah. a laptop, and then like the, the person who's the tech person who's doing the zoom, it's really easy to be like spotlight this one now spotlight this one now spotlight yeah. this one. So it's like, you're watching like a live broadcast event and it will look so professional if you have multiple devices and different angles. So it's yeah, really cool. different camera angles. I will say if you are taking notes on this, um, make sure that all of your extra devices are disconnected from audio. Otherwise you'll get the, uh, the dreaded feedback loop, which is no bueno. Um, and not fun and certainly not fun. This is also why you hope to rehearsal so that you can practice setting up everything beforehand. Um, but yeah, absolutely. It's, it's really cool to see, to be able to go to different camera angles and to feel like you're, yeah, you're in a broadcast. This also works for, uh, if you do a candle lighting where you have an altar, um, you can have a specific phone dedicated to just showing that candle. So that candle is, is one of the video screens during your event. Uh, so Mandy talked about planning a virtual event and the considerations that you need to take for that. And uh, I'm going to talk about planning a hybrid event. So there are some of the same steps as a virtual event, but of course you have the additional considerations of a venue. And here are my, our first steps in our recommended order. 
Um, however, with the caveat that one and two can be interchangeable. So with a hybrid event, you have to make sure, you wanna make sure that you have an ideal date and time that works for everybody, but you also wanna make sure that, the, that it works for the venue as well. So I would say, you should be flexible or have a couple of ideal dates and times to check if the venue is available and then booking the date and time with your with your venue as well. Um, so yeah, um, for picking the date and time, like Mandy said, you'll want to take time zones into account um, for booking with a venue since there are extra components like catering, seating, maybe some COVID restrictions, you'll want to have some more lead time when planning that. Um, and then when booking your venue, read the contract, talk to your event manager, um, talk to the venue facilitator to see exactly what's included. Because sometimes you need to rent an additional uh, projector or a TV or speakers, and sometimes it's included in the rental cost. Um, as well with the virtual, like the virtual event, you're going to create invitations and we do things, you'll find that Mandy and I do things a little bit differently, but that's awesome. Um, we send out invitations via email for guests joining virtually and they just have a clickable link. Um, but one thing that I've realized now that restrictions are opening up in Vancouver is that um, you'll want to consider the COVID restrictions in your area before you send, before you put a an address on your virtual invitations. So for instance, if you, I would recommend telling, reaching out specifically to those who you want to have at the in-person event, and then everybody else send a PDF with the virtual login, just so that you can have your numbers um, for COVID limitations and restrictions. And then just like number two, assessing the equipment at your location. So you'll want to see if they are able to have a TV screen or a monitor. Um, you'll need speakers or a PA system that can connect to a little microphone. Um, microphone is very helpful. And of course, an internet connection. Internet is very important, and this could definitely be for another seminar, but uh, ideally you'll want to wire in. So that means um, I'm currently wired in. It's a little Ethernet cable. So for Mac users, you may need an adapter, but that goes directly into the wall and connects to the inter or to your modem directly. So connects right to the internet that ensures the strongest connection possible. So that's the first little hump that we um, want you to consider. And then for the roles, you will have noticed for the last slide, we talked about the family and planning team, speakers, your tech team. And for a hybrid event, you'll want someone who is able to be your on-site contact. So this on-site contact ideally is not a member of the family or not someone who is expected to or is expecting to be fully present and participate in the service. So it's that one person who's dedicated to monitoring the laptop that's connected to the screen. So for example, if you want to do a toast or a virtual garden or um, a candle lighting, then this on-site contact is going to be the one changing the screen from speaker view to gallery view. And so unfortunately, as tech facilitators, we are a little limited to what you personally can see on your screen. Um, and so you need to have someone there in person to switch the, the computer. Um, but when you're working with a remote team like New Narrative or like Keeper, um, we'll handle all of the, the pieces that you see on the screen so that everybody can see the same thing at the same time. And whoever your on-site contact is, they're the eyes and the ears, they're connecting with the remote team and they're essentially being being guided as to what to do. So it's very, it can be very low stress if you've got a team that is experienced in, with hybrid events. So if you're gonna remember anything from what I just said, ideally nobody in the family um, so that they can be present for the service. Next slide is just more about what to look for in a venue. So if you want, you can screenshot this. I won't go through each one in particular, but the biggest ones being, uh, you'll just want to know what is included. So what kind of equipment, what kind of people, um, if something goes wrong, who is going to be there for you? Is there someone going to be someone there for you? And um, yeah, it, just whether your cameras and your angles and the internet connection is big. Yeah. And so some venues are like totally turnkey and some of them are like, here's a blank mm -hmm. space, 
figure it out. So yeah. if that's the, if you do have a blank space and you're willing to rent everything, check the internet. Cause that's not something that you really rent. That's like the, for sure, the biggest pieces Christina mentioned. Definitely. And there's a big thing about a hotspotting. Um, I have hot, for those of you who are wondering, I have hotspotted a zoom on in a semi-remote area on two mm. bars before it's not going to give you the clearest picture. However, um, I've also been saying that when you have a Zoom meeting and a hybrid event and not ideal internet quality, like outside, um, sometimes you sacrifice a little bit of video quality in order to get that interaction with friends and family. So it's to me, it's worth it. Um, but of course, if you have a Zoom meeting and you're you're doing a hybrid event, um, it's not in this presentation, but uh, always have a camera that's in the background filming your filming your event just in case. Awesome. So let's dive right into invitations. Um, I also realized like we still have so much to talk to you guys about when we're running. We have so much, we only have like 10 minutes left, but we're good to like stay a bit later if you all are. So if you can stay later, we'll be here with you a bit later. So we'll try to go through this quickly, but we're also going to try to prepare something for you all to take home um, when we send this out after. So you can have some notes. Invitations, obviously, again, just like a wedding, very important. Um, they can really talk about, you know, it can really demonstrate the person and, um, and a bit of their personality and introduce people. So many different ways today that you can actually make an event um, invitation. So you can see all the ones on the list, Adobe Photoshop Illustrator. If you're a seasoned graphic designer, absolutely use that. If you're not, Canva is the way to go 100%. Um, there's a ton of templates for free or for paid users. It's plug and play. It's beautiful, really easy to use. That would be my number one recommendation. To track your RSVPs, you have a few options. Um, we'll talk about Keeper event pages really briefly after, but Keeper and a few other um, companies within this space offer event pages. So our pages allow you to track your RSVPs. You can do the same thing with a private email. If you have a big guest list, I don't recommend it. It's gonna be a lot of back and forth, a lot of emails in your inbox. You're gonna to need to create um, an Excel spreadsheet basically. Um, but there's a lot of different ways that this can be done. If it's a small guest list, that's fine. You can even do it via text message and then write down who's coming, who's not. There's also services like Eventbrite and Paperless Post. Paperless Post, what's nice with it, it has like the beautiful invite itself. If you've ever received one, you click on it and it like opens up and it's all pretty. And then you can RSVP as well. And then of course there's Facebook events. Only thing to consider with Facebook is if you want to make the event private and not all of your guests are on Facebook, they will not be able to see the Facebook event. So they can be, and the invites themselves can be sent as mentioned, like via a system like paperless post. If you're familiar with any email marketing, MailChimp is a really great way. So the actual body of the email is in there, or you can make a PDF or an image file and share that to all of the guests. So it depends on how comfortable you are with the different types of technology, but all options work quite well. And to briefly touch on event pages, you can check it out at mykeeper.com, but our event pages are connected to the memorial page and Guests can RSVP, they can click directly on the link to access the Zoom. You can track your guest list and guests can be like, they can ask questions, you can answer them live. So it really feels and acts like a Facebook event page, but it's not within the Facebook ecosystem. And then I always obviously have to talk about this a little bit because that's what I've been doing for the past, I don't know, eight years of my life. Um, so online memorial pages, great way for people to start sharing memories and photographs and it's all connected to the event page. Um, and again, we have like free and paid options. So check that out, mykeeper.com if you're interested in doing that for either a loved one or for your clients. Yeah, yeah, and as sorry, someone like, who does I'm not, surprised. no, that's okay. As someone who does not have, so New Narrative does not have memorial pages, it is super helpful to work with a company like Keeper to have a place where everybody can go. And um, in a couple a couple slides ago, I saw my, uh, you saw my version of the invitation. And what we would do is on the second page with any instructions, we can actually have a hyperlink to mm -hmm. visit, visit, um, Marsha's my keeper page at this link. Like click here to to leave a story or a memory and and get some more event information. So that's yeah. really really helpful as an event planner. 
And if you're super tech savvy, you can even make like a quick website on Wix too, if you mm. want something very particular. So like Wix or Squarespace, things like that. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Everybody's, everybody's texting out links these days, links and yeah. event invites. Um, yeah. A one, one difference between Mandy and I is uh, Mandy, of course, uses the Keeper website as a portal and I create PDFs that are clickable and that the families can email out. And then I also have a little uh, private page on the new narrative website. So if you need to WhatsApp or text a link, then you just copy paste and direct people to the website um, yeah, to get the event information. Totally. Um, okay. Now moving on. To yeah. So here's the planning part of it, right? Um, so this is like really the meat of it. So we talked about this already, create your list of speakers and performers. Um, we use the word performers because we've actually had a lot of people do live performances with mm -hmm. either music or singing, and it's so beautiful and so meaningful. Definitely do an audio check first though. Some people don't realize how loud their voices are and it will be jarring. <laughs> yeah, and if you get too loud, I like to say that it breaks the Zoom barrier. So if we had someone singing opera once and it got, she was, she was giving her and it was so loud that when it gets to a certain, uh, I guess, loudness, Zoom actually kind of mutes your voice. Mm -hmm. So what Mandy just said about doing a tech check is super important. Yeah. Exactly. And so once you know who's going to talk, who's going to perform, you'll be able to actually make your order of service program mm -hmm. outline. Very simple. We'll show you an example, who's talking when, what's being shown to people when, and just the order and writing that in a script, which we'll talk about super important, super helpful. Mm -hmm. And once you know what you're actually going to be including within the order of service, you're going to say, okay, we're going to be showing, you know, a two minute video of old family videos. We're going to show a slideshow and then, you know, uncle Joe in Florida wants to send his video recording of a eulogy because he can't be there. So because you're going to know what you have, you can then start gathering it. So you tell the family or yourself, okay, I want to make a slideshow. You gather all of that. You put it mm -hmm. together. Very basic. And then of course, before you get started, you have to host a rehearsal. Um, we really, really recommend this. And uh, especially for hybrid uh, rehearsals are super key. Is there anything you wanna add there, Christina? Yeah, I mean, hosting, we usually host two. So we'll have an introductory mm -hmm. kind of run through or just um, uh, a, a session to get, yeah, like to get everybody familiar with the equipment and how everything's gonna change just with the venue itself. And then if anybody is speaking virtually, we'll host the virtual rehearsal. Uh, rehearsals typically are a day or two beforehand. I love doing it a day or two beforehand, setting aside at least an hour. Usually it takes 15 to 20 minutes, but setting aside that hour to be able to just breathe and ask questions and show everybody what it's going to look and feel like during the event. So to get them used to okay, if we're having a master of ceremonies, this is what the camera is going to look like when we spotlight Andy, when she introduces you. And then at this point in time, you will come front and center on screen and this is your cue to begin. And so we'll practice that and, and get, gives everybody a very low stress um, air, arena to ask, ask any questions. Because if they're, I find if you host an event before, everybody's different. But for me personally, I find that if you host a rehearsal 45 minutes or 60 minutes before the event, everybody's already a little, uh, a little antsy On and edge. anxious. Yeah. Yeah. And they're already really nervous because of course they don't really know what's, what's to be expected. And yeah, it just a day or two before is perfect. Ideally at the same time as your event. So you can check uh, what the lighting is going to look like. So for example, if, uh, if Uncle Joe at the last minute in Florida decides to speak live and he's in his kitchen and there's a big window behind him, of course, the video is going to be distorted a little bit. So you want to catch that before the event day. Totally. Okay. Yeah. Great advice. Now, when it comes to creating your program and order of service, one of the things that Mandy and I absolutely love to do and encourage our clients to embrace is, is some kind of personal element. And and community element. So these are my 
two tips. Um, and then Mandy will talk about some legacy projects on the next slide. But I love to encourage families to embrace gallery view. So whether it's me, it's usually me that will come on as the person who's done that technical introduction at the beginning. If we're doing a group toast, I'll come back on screen because people will already know me as the, the tech person. I'll come back on screen and I'll ask everybody to change their, to take a moment to change their view to gallery so they can see more people on their screens. And for a hybrid event, if you remember that on-site contact, the person who's at the computer is going to be the one changing the view. So you can actually, if you're in person, you can see all the little video boxes on your screen, as long as that person has changed to gallery view. And um, my tip is to provide instructions based on different devices. So for example, if you're going to, you're going to tell people how to switch if they're on a computer or how to change to gallery view, you know, the switch to gallery view button is right about here or swipe to see more people if you're on a smartphone. And then of course, the group activity or the legacy project is one of my favorite things to do. Um, and this is really, as Mandy was saying, when you're in that planning process and getting to know your honoree and getting to know the family, getting to know preferences and little quirks and, and little pieces that you can, you can bring into the event. And as you see on these pictures on the left-hand side, the top is a group toast. And then the bottom left-hand side is a virtual garden that we did. And uh, a fun fact is, I think out of all the people that you see, maybe two people were in Canada and the rest were in the Philippines. And so everybody was able to still get together and, and everybody kind of interprets it differently. So my favorite, the personalized uh, element rarely ever goes perfectly. So for example, if you do the virtual hand holding, like if you put your hands up to the screen and go I've like this. I've never done that. <laughs> really? Oh my goodness. Yeah. It, it feels like, I wish we, if we had everybody on screen, we would, yeah. we would all do this, but it's great. It's like, it never, it never turns out perfectly, but that therein lies the specialness of this group activity. So, you know, there's some people like this and some people confused and it's just <laughs> capturing all of that is so lovely. And with the virtual garden, I've seen, you see people have plants, um, different flowers. Somebody actually once took their phone and got a picture of, a, of some daffodils and put them up to the screen. So it's like in whatever kind of accessible way, you can have people participate and have your guests participate, which I love. Awesome. Yeah. And so um, on that note for the legacy projects, um, some other ideas that you can consider is, as Christina mentioned, gardening, um, cooking, yoga is one. So we'll hire like a yoga instructor who will actually do like a yoga uh, class at the end of the service. Um, the picture on the bottom is one where we all created, uh, we all made a martini. So if you're doing any legacy activity, just make sure that within the invite at the beginning, folks know what they need to prepare. So we gave right. everyone a shopping list for the cocktail <laughs> or for the cooking class. And it was like a really cute little shopping list that you could even like print out or like save it on your phone. And like it pick, you have to pick up all your ingredients before. So you make sure you give oops, enough time. If it's yoga, it's like, okay, be in your yoga clothes or have your yoga mat ready. And um, there are so many fun ones. And actually, Christina, I think you wanted to share something that you guys did as well on the-, the Oh the my goodness, side. yeah. Well, third from the bottom is we, you can incorporate a TikTok dance. And so we, for an, a memorial that I did, that we did last year, actually did it with my colleague, Megan Sheldon of Be Ceremonial, which Be Ceremonial is amazing if you want some ideas on rituals. Um, we did, so the family, the grandma was soup, was known for getting involved in all of her grandkids' TikTok dances and the grandkids I think we're everywhere from six to 18. And so the, the three youngest grandkids, like six, eight, nine, they filmed a little video and everybody was encouraged to stand up to switch to gallery view. And then we played the video of the kids being like, come dance with us. And then they're like, these are the moves. And, and you see all these people standing up and, and they're like, you know, they're, they're dancing along to That's this TikTok so dance, along with the video of their, the grandma 
It was really cool. And then the, the second to last one that I have on there is asking the guests to do the wave. And so for a, there was a gentleman who was very into his soccer team. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And just like how I mentioned that nothing ever goes like perfectly and according to plan. So even though we were super meticulous and like, okay, everybody's on the same kind of gallery view. Um, I changed my settings where everybody, you know, we can all see the same people, the same thing. And, you know, it's like the wave starting from the top and then it's going down and going down. And then it stops at somebody who's super confused and doesn't know what's happening. And then you see, like, it just, it's the ripple effect. And then you see the people at the bottom, like start to do this. And again, never goes according to plan, but therein lies the special, it's really like a capsule of, of our, of the time now and, and where we are as, you know, as a community and, and just, it's so special to have that on video. Anyway, facilitating the wave, something I would definitely try again. (laughs) I love it. I love it. That sounds so cool. Um, So we talked about this already, so I won't really go into detail, but um, showing home videos, we did that for my grandma's. We like went through all all of our old family videos and put together a little compilation and played that at the end and put some music in the background. And it was so lovely. Um, And if you are creating a slideshow, most slideshow softwares will actually allow you to put images and videos. So it could be images and then like a quick video and then images and a quick video. So just take what you have, you know, luckily we we're starting to have more and more of our um, of our analog items digitized. Um, so if you haven't done that yet, start digitizing all of your family photos and videos. Um, it's wonderful. Um, I almost and then the- feel like you can have a slide based on that. It's like how to digitize oh, yeah. your photos and, uh, Costco's actually pretty good. <laughs> really Costco. Okay. Okay. I, yeah, there are a couple of apps out there and I find that taking a picture of a picture, although tedious is still is okay, but Okay, Costco. I had someone ask me about that this afternoon, so I'll keep that in mind. Yeah. Um, but while we're talking about that, and while you're saying this, Rhonda has been waiting very patiently for us to answer oh, yes. this question about answer. music and yes. how do you how do you manage music on your end? Well, so end? I am not a copyright intellectual property attorney. My sister is, and I haven't asked her this question yet. Actually, I did, but we haven't talked about it yet. Basically. Um, If you're playing it during a Zoom, I wouldn't worry about it. Don't worry about copyright. What you have to worry about is if you are putting um, that video on a memorial page or on YouTube after, you can't include the music. So my suggestion is to find a slideshow company, um, like the company we use, that actually allows you to license the copyright music for your slideshow so that you actually have the license to do so. But if it's just to play a song, kind of like we did at the opening of this talk during a Zoom event, I wouldn't worry about it, but do not take my word for it. That is legal. We pay into uh, SoCan. And so for our hybrid events, um, SoCan based in Canada. And I understand there's a little bit more for licensing. There's two or three in the U.S. that you have to license with. So it gets a little more complicated. And I know that for the U.S., there's the, you can get a music license through the funeral, maybe the NFDA or something adjacent, but for Canada, I don't know. I don't know if FSAC or the, like for me, the BCFA has something like that. I should probably look into it rather than. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, like, so if you're doing this, like as your business, then obviously look into it. If you're doing one Mm -hmm. event for your family or friend, right. Don't worry about it too much. Just know that if you post a video with a copyright song onto any other sharing platform, it will get taken down. Yeah, definitely. Um, And then the only other thing I wanted to mention, the last one on the, on the personalization If you are not sure what to do, you're stressed, you have a short timeline, the easiest thing in the world to do is to consume something they love or just to have a toast. So for us, my grandmother loved Chivas. It's, um, she loved Chivas. So we said, get a glass of Chivas ready. It's like a type of bourbon or whiskey. Oh my God, she's going to kill me. (laughs) Um, So she just loved that. So we told everyone in the invite as well, you tell them ahead of time. And at the beginning of the service, make sure you have something ready for a toast. So doing a toast is super simple. It's so meaningful. Um, but also if they love like coffee or pie or like a yeah. particular cookie, like I love Oreos. Like I want some, everyone to eat a bunch of Oreos during my funeral. Um, you can do that. It's accessible. It's easy. And it's meaningful. Uh, Oreos also very portable in pockets. If you just have to do an in-person <laughs> event. 
<laughs> totally yes. going on a script. Um, yeah, and just be wary. Um, back to what Mandy was saying about the time zones. If you have an event that's happening at 1 p.m. Eastern and you would like to do a fireball shot, just keep in mind that some people tuning in, it will be 10 a.m. Um, and this has <laughs> happened to me before. <laughs> Where it's like, we want everybody to do fireball. And then, yeah, it's 10, 10 15, or, you know, by that time, it's about 11 30. Hey, it's an honor like, of someone, right? So, to- yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's five o'clock somewhere. All right. We are past our time, but we will keep going. We only have a couple left. Thank you all for hanging on with us. Yeah. We've Um, got everybody here still. This is freaking cool. Thanks. Um, Okay. Event day. My, the first thing I do before on the event day is I double check all my audio and video. I like to keep everything in one folder and I like to hit play on everything to make sure that it all plays well The best thing is depending on the system you use, if you have your screen open at full screen and you close it while it's in full screen, it should technically open in full screen again, which means that you won't have to go with your mouse and click to make it go bigger. I like to have the less amount of mouse activity on the screen as possible. So, and if let's say you're sharing just audio, you don't have to share your screen. Or what I like to do is I actually like, change the background of my computer to the order of service so that there's always something nice on the screen and it's not like my desktop with a bunch of things on it. Clean your desktop up. (laughs) Oh yeah, totally. And then there's also, when you do screen sharing, you can do little, uh, there's all all these little, little hacks that we've developed in order to make it look as clean as possible. Yeah, that's, that's a good one. Yeah. So there's lots of tips around Zoom like that, that you can find online. Obviously, if this was like a three hour talk, we can go through them all with you, Um, but we don't have that much time. Um, Of course, the day of the event, log on early. You should be there before the family and then have the family. And when I say family, I mean, those that are going to be speaking. And if it's a client, generally the clients um, so that they're comfortable, they look good, they sound good. Even though you just did a run through, check everybody's audio again. Don't like, don't let anyone stay on mute. Make sure that you hear everybody's voice once before you start the event. Mm -hmm. And then um, following a script. So your order of your script is basically going to be your order of service with a bit more detail in there, just so that you can follow along. I will print my script because I have so much going on on my computer that I'll have it printed and I'll just go through and I'll literally cross things off as we go through the event. Do you do that at all, Christina? Um, I do not. I just have okay. it open on uh, on like Google Sheets. We do our little, our little type okay. script, and then it. But it's usually like confirming with my tech. Okay, so this is coming up next, right? Okay, this yeah. is coming up next, right? And then yeah, that that little thing. But it's not uncommon. I've heard. I've worked with some people who do that. So, yeah, hey, I like whatever to whatever works. Cross it off. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then um, of course your tech person can be the one to do this, or you may even designate like a family friend to have someone help people with technical difficulty, very basic. So that if someone's like panicking in the chat, um, you can have someone that's not you trying to host assist them. That's very important. Mm, Absolutely. And then, so this is for a virtual event. And now when you go to hybrid events, Here's it's it's kind of similar but a little bit different. Um, so of course, arriving early to the venue, everybody for an in-person event, guests always arrive early. Um, so I would just arrive early at least an hour and a half before the event start time, and then log in early. So I usually log in an hour before everything with my tech, um, go through audio and video, and um, have your remote facilitator. Oops, have your remote facilitator uh, handy and and on logged into the stream then i like to start a group chat with my tech team so whether that's in something like slack or whatsapp or imessage uh, we all start a little chat together to check in and uh, have a communication going behind the scenes following a script on event day so this goes for everybody on the virtual side of things and your on-site contact so making sure that they have a little you know a little folio with them and have that maybe they have the tech script printed out and they're crossing things off and then uh very similar have a remote person standing by to help guests experiencing technical difficulties so this is the hotline um very important that it's not your on-site contact because if you 
think about that example that I showed earlier of that TV screen at the front of the room. If you have someone sitting beside the TV screen and they get a call from somebody who's like, I can't get, I can't log on for whatever reason, or the link is not working, then you know, they'll have to answer it right there and then at the front of the room. And so you want to have someone remote or in the other room or just not, not in that, not in the space with you to field these questions. Um, and one of our last slides is uh, the program samples. So here's what a typical event could look like. Yeah, so um, we can send these to you all after. And it was really interesting because Christina and I, as we were building this presentation, we realized that we do things a little differently. Mm -hmm. and so different things will work for you. Um, so the opening is always very basic. You log in early regardless. And we always like to start by playing music. And I think Christina does that as well. And then we'll actually show the order of service as like a screen share. So people can just see what's coming up next and they know that they're in the right place. Um, and then of course the host is the one that really, or the master of ceremonies, the celebrant, however you'd like to call that can really um, drive this. So, you know, you welcome everyone. If you choose to do so, technical instructions. And then we like to do, you know, the eulogy, then the first speaker. And then I like to kind of switch it up. I like to go to videos and then go back to a speaker. So I kind of like to make it dynamic and have different things happening and not just be like talks and then like three slideshow videos. So it really depends on also the content of it. Um, and then we like to then after do open sharing, which means you open up the floor. If it's a service where there's so much content, we've had this before where families are just like, we're gonna have a video and then another video and then another speaker. And it's like never ending. We basically say, you don't really have time for an open sharing or we'll decide during the event itself to be like, you know what, let's give us 10 minutes to do it. I always like to do the legacy activity um, either at the very end, because let's say it's a yoga activity. There's gonna be, let's say there's gonna be a, you know, a 45 minute yoga event you're going to want to let some guests leave because not everyone's going to do that. Always end with a group toast, in my opinion. I think that they're a wonderful way to say bye. And we actually like to make everyone wave so that after we have like a screen of everyone saying bye or blowing oh, a kiss. So yeah. And, uh, and to end the event, this is kind of important, right. but we kind of like to just end the event and to close out. If not, it kind of has like that awkward silence, but you can jump back on with the family after, but that's kind of how we do it. Yeah, and for a hybrid event and a little bit about how we like to do the virtual services. So you can see the differences between the virtual and the hybrid, they're in red. So for example, the venue opens up an hour before. Um, and then when you see the open share, you have virtual guests followed by in-person guests. And then for the event, and uh, we coordinate when the venue logs off and begin, you know, they can begin the closing procedures. Um, but when it comes to the program samples, yeah, just like Mandy, we put together an order of events so that people logging in early can see and they can they can be there they can listen to some favorite music we have a technical introduction and then we introduce our master of ceremonies or go into our first speaker and we work with the family to create also create a dynamic program based on you know the videos and we try and break it up where possible to keep everybody engaged um, I always find that it's helpful to have your in-person or sorry, your more formal program starting out. And then as the, as everybody gets familiar with the format and what is happening, then you can introduce the slideshow, then you introduce the open share, the group toasts. And so guests have already, they've been there, they understand what it's like with the different camera angles. And then you can, you can kind of ease everybody into this open share. Um, for my events specifically, I'm finding that the formal portion is about an hour and then the open share is about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, something that is not on this slide for an open share, always have one or two people preset and ready to go. It makes more of a difference than you think. And this can also be a really good um, task for anybody who says, oh, is there anything I can help or I can do, or can I, can I help you in any way? Sure. Can you be the first person that starts our, our open share? And for the open share, uh, our facilitator will come on screen and we'll, you know, this is how you raise your hand and we'll be calling everybody out one, one at a time. And our first share will be from Nandi, who is 
who, who will be our first share for today. And this person, you know, nobody There's, else, there could be such awkward silence. If not, it's, yeah, it's, it could be a real thing. Everyone just to let you know. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. And your first couple are not going to be very smooth. Like it is, it is more of an art than a science, but uh, you, it'll be fine. And the, the main thing is that the family gets to hear all these stories and memories and, you know, they can write in the chat if they want, if people don't feel comfortable on camera. Um, yeah, so that, that, those are event program samples. Of course, both of us, after the event happens, we both save our files. We give all of the, the recordings, the chats to our families um, within a couple of business days after. Takes, takes a little bit of time to get those formatted. Um, this is just a very quick, feel free to take a screenshot of it. We can also send this out after. It's just an easy grid that we've created to give you the differences between the four formats, um, a little bit about each, wh what you can expect with guest participation, um, the devices you might want to have on site, and of course, the considerations. Um, not necessarily the, the cons, but you know things to consider that aren't that might be might be a negative. Um, yeah, and so again, if you wanna take a moment to take a screenshot, go ahead. Okay, and then uh, we'll send this to you after. Thank you everyone. So really yeah, fun. thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you for staying 18 minutes after. If there are any other questions, feel free we to We do put have them. one that we oh. just got from Catherine. So do your organizations oh, work with funeral homes and funeral directors or more with families directly? We, we do a mix, but I would say we work more with families directly. That's personally what we do, but we offer the service to our funeral home clients as well. Amazing. And yeah, we do a little bit of both. I find that funeral homes, uh, a majority of our clients are families, um, but we find that, yeah, we find, we find that it's just very new, or I find that it's very new for lots of the, lots of the homes and lot, you know, people understand what live streaming is, but I think it's going to take a couple of sample events and, and more people attending the two-way stream to uh, really catch on at funeral homes. So for the majority, our clients are families, direct families or independent funeral homes that are really, that, that understand that this, uh, this can be a two-way, uh, a two-way experience. Yeah. Well, thank well, you. Thanks everybody. Thank you coming up. Um, yeah. So you will all receive an email from um, Round Glass with the recording uh, I know Keeper and Talk Death will also publish the recordings on our platforms and we will put, because we have to go through this so fast, we'll put a little handout together for you all to help guide you as well. Um, so I was Mandy. Here's the info for Keeper. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Definitely. And I'm sure you can message us anytime. Our DMs are open. Um, yeah. And I'm so glad that so many of you are getting some great information out of this. Yeah. Thanks, cool. everyone. Take Thank care. you. Bye. Yeah, this is great. See ya. Okay.